Good morning. All right. So what is it that we like about computers? How did, we, how did we all come to fall in love with them? I think we've all got, like, stories, right? Uh, you know, for some people it was they, the, the first time they saw, like, desktop publishing. They realized that, you know, you could, you could make a magazine because you cared about, like, design and writing, not paper and glue. Um, for some people it was, you know, they, the first time they played a video game, they realized, oh, in this tiny little machine, there's, there's a whole world inside here. And, you know, we're lucky few of us uh, have been on cyberspace. Uh, you know, we, we've had the experience of like, oh, I just sent somebody an email on the other side of the world and it, it got to them instantaneously. That's a, it, it's, it's an incredible sensation. The running theme in all these is the, in these origin stories is how computers, they empower people by removing physical constraints. And they let us live in this, this Willy Wonka land of pure imagination. And this, this is what, this software at its finest. This is, this is why Steve Jobs calls the personal computer the bicycle for the mind. But uh, all these share a fundamental limitation. Uh, we, the programmers, we sing these worlds into existence for users to inhabit. But the users, they, they can't really go beyond what we give them. There's this, there's this gap between using and programming. Now this, this is, my, this is my origin story. This is how I came to love computers. I think, uh, I think you know, I'm, I'm talking to programmers, I think that we all have a, you know, a first program, something along these lines. But, you know, if, if we want to go from, you know, printing butts forever to you know, actually making the software, well, you remember what that was like. It's, 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 a, it's a process. I mean, so when somebody comes in and say, I want to make my own software, well, what's, what's the next step after this? And, and believe it or not, this, this is a huge advancement over what, we, what you know, home computer programming was like even 10 years ago. Uh, this is worlds away from like writing 6502 assembler. But you know, most of us, we, we've all had to deal with something like this, but you know, this is just insurmountably arcane for most people. Now, it, it reminds me of this cartoon, How to Draw an Owl. <laughs> uh, but you know, this is, honestly, if, if this was what programming was like, it, you know, it, programming is even worse than this, because you know, I can't draw a, a beautiful owl, but I can draw this, you know, this thing that looks kind of like a parakeet. Um, you know, you, and you might not be able to draw a beautiful flower, but you can still draw a recognizably, recognizable if, you know, kind of shitty one. Now for, now, for most people, th these drawing skills, these are sufficient. These are useful. You know, even if we can't draw this beautiful owl, we can draw, you know, diagrams and maps and uh, this cool-looking S. Um, and, you know, I, I wrote a pretty dire novel in my early 20s, but, like, I, I'm still fairly confident in, in my ability to write shopping lists and thank you notes and, you know, code. You know, I, you know nobody's going to say that I'm that I'm illiterate because, you know, I wrote a thinly veiled memoir instead of the novel I thought I was doing. Um, you know, a handful of us will go on to draw owls the right way and write real novels, but like, you know, we don't claim that only novelists are literate. And, but for some reason, programming is treated differently. Uh, most of our tools, they're not designed for, you know, shitty owls and shopping lists. And our, our culture expects people to learn how to draw without ever learning how to doodle. I wonder if this is because a big part of our culture wants programming to be hard, wants us to be like this elite class. Uh, we view any tools that claim to make programming easier with suspicion. It's, you know, that, well, that's not real programming. Um, that's, that's dumbing it down. This is like, you know, you can do this, but this is for noobs. You, have, if, you know, people haven't paid their dues. Uh, we don't want to believe that we're these like perfectly rational iconoclasts, but we're desperate for, to find any orthodoxy to cling on to and just use it as a cudgel against anything that's actually, you know, new. I can't help but, but See, this facet of our culture is that it's like schoolboys who are perpetuating these generations old hazing rituals. But, you know, no matter what we do, we, we look up to Jykstra and he just glowers back at us. And, you know, he's, he's still disappointed that, you know, we're not writing formal proofs of our programs. <laughs> so, so how do we bridge the gap between users and programmers? Now, there's, there's two sides to this. Uh, one that's technological, one that's more cultural. Now, on the tech side, I'm going to talk about a tool called HyperCard. Uh, you know, first, what it looks like today, and second, what it could look like in, or what it can, what it can lead to in 2016, 25 years from now. Uh, then we'll look at the, the harder part, the ways that our culture will need to change in order to get from here to there and fulfill the promise of a bicycle for the mind. So HyperCard, it's a, it's a tool for building simple programs that use cards and stacks as the central metaphor. 
Um, so the presentation I'm giving, that's a stack. Um, you know, the, these buttons on the bottom row here, these are like links to other cards in the stack. And these icons here, these are links to other stacks. You know, a lot of the, you know, this is the, one of the, the example uh, stacks that comes with HyperCard. Uh, a lot of, most of the example stacks end up being like, basically just like fancy databases, but, or, you know, databases with a nice UI. But it turns out like a lot of software is just databases with a nice UI. And uh, you can just like go through pages. The interesting thing here is there's no distinction between, um, there's no like data side and presentation side. Any, any output field is also an input field. You know, this, this has some, you know, obvious weaknesses for, you know, programmers when you, if you're thinking about this from uh, abstraction purposes, but it's, it's really hard to beat for simplicity. And you can uh, insert a new card. Um, I'm just going to put in my, I'm not going to put in my actual address because this is, you know, I don't want to get junk mail. Um, but, you know, and, and it just uses the, it, it, they all, all the cards can share like a background. Um, and uh, so if we go to if we go into the background mode, you see the little stripes here. That's now now this is the this is the shared um, background used by all the cards, uh, or or in the, or or the, the cards in this section. So this is the this is the primary system of abstraction in HyperCard. Now I'm gonna redesign this, or I'm gonna redesign this in fast motion. Um, it's uh, it's actually quite tedious to watch this in real time. Uh, it's, it's a lot more fun to do. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you, you can change the background, you know, rearrange all the icons um, or in the fields, and it's, it, you're, it doesn't, you know, all, all the data updates to match it. So now, yeah, layout has changed, the content remains. We can add some stuff to the foreground. So let's, uh, let's make a button that links back to the presentation. Um, there we go. I'm very fast at typing. Um, <laughs> There we go. Now, now, did we just program? Um, well, we built software, but we didn't code anything. Now, HyperCard, it, it actually does have a programming language built into it called HyperTalk. But, you know, so on here, we've got this here. This just, like, hides the menu bar in the tool window when I open up the stack so it's more presentation-y. And then this one, this block of code here, this is so it works with my presentation remote. But, you know, I need to write this, this, this code because I've been doing some fancy stuff, but like, this is not an essential part of like, the hyper, hypermedia authoring experience. You, know, you, don't, you don't need to do this to be productive. I mean, you know, uh, also, just an aside, I really like how they handle the event handlers here. I hope somebody copies that. Um, uh, even if, you, even if you end up writing a little bit of code, you don't have to write a lot of it. It's, uh, you know, hypercard... What, what, it, what it does is it blurs lines between, you know, between programs and documents, uh, between databases and UIs, and, and most importantly, between programmers and users. But now, now the, what it could be. So, so HyperCard, it's not perfect. It's, it's, a, it's Mac only. It costs kind of a lot of money. It has some pretty severe limitations to the programming environment. Uh, I don't really have time to get into specifics, um, but... You know, natural language programming, I think, is the, the, the advantages of having, like, English-like syntax is overrated. Um, also, HyperCard doesn't have any data structures. Everything is a string, but don't worry about that. Um, but, uh, you know, it, what it, the important thing is that it proves that hypermedia can work in the real world on, like, real home computers. You don't need every, every hypermedia system before this has been, you know, some experimental thing that was, like, done at a university or, like, in a lab, and it's like, well, this could work on if everybody has, like, these, you know, $70,000 Xerox Altos. However, um, but, you know, I'm, I'm really excited about where HyperCard and its, you know, successors can go in the future. So, so let's explore that future. So what will hypermedia look like in 25 years? Now, Again, the, the technology side, we can, we can bet pretty, com pretty confidently that computers are going to be much faster, much more powerful, uh, and the uh, information superhighway is going to be faster and more widely available. But we need a little more, um, I don't know, vision to imagine a world where there's no, where, 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 with reduced barriers between users and programmers. So uh, for the, the future technology side, is, you know, I want to answer, like, how will today's users become tomorrow's hypermedia authors, and how will today's programmers, us, how will we empower them? And we look at the other user-friendly programming environment, uh, spreadsheets, uh, we see a few key characteristics. You know, one, they, they allow direct manipulation. Uh, there's no separate data and presentation modes. It's all what you see is what you get. 
Uh, that direct manipulation enables non-programmers to explore. If you want to try something out, you don't need to like, convince a programmer to build it for you. You, you, just, you can just do it yourself. And this then means that programs can be transient. Then, you know, the, because the, problem, the program isn't a product, it's, it's, a, it's an artifact of the exploration prog process. It's like, it's like having a sketch or a study for an artist. Now, but, but even when your tools enable rapid development, distribution challenges can, can, for, can force to be slow and ponderous. Um, so like Excel and HyperCard, they can make it very easy for an individual to sketch software out for themselves, but you know, distribution still involves getting boxes with disks into stores, uh, and that's still real time and real money, and there's no, which really limits your ability for, or limits your space for experimentation, you know, fluff. Now, I think this is, this is really apparent in the, the packaged hypermedia-based software you see today. So for, for some reason, HyperCard's niche has become this, like, this ex extremely like, high-culture educational software. Like, um, so this is uh, Beethoven's Ninth Symphony CD Companion. And it, like, it walks you through like, all the, you know, the like in, in here it's like talking about Sonata form and how it relates to the Ninth Symphony. And you know, don't get me wrong, it's, it's, it's excellent software, but it's not representative of the kind that everybody's going to be writing. I mean, not, not everything we make has to be a monument. Now, if we put hypermedia on the internet, um, then the distribution problems kind of fall by the wayside. Now software travels from my computer to yours at the speed of light, um, modulo how fast a 9600 baud modem can decode. Um, but freed from the burden of permanence, what could uh, hypermedia-based software look like? Well, I would expect a lot of the people making uh, traditional media today will be making hypermedia tomorrow. And uh, a lot of what we do today with newspapers and magazines and like, you know, alternative weeklies and stuff, those would be a natural fit for hypermedia. Um, HyperCard's tool in, you know, currently HyperCard's tools for layout and content management are not like particularly sophisticated. They're, little, they're honestly a little primitive, but I can only imagine that like as they mature, they'll become as, as sophisticated as anything that you'd see in desktop publishing, you know, like in, in Quark or in PageMaker. Um, there, and there's, there's no way we're going to regress on this front. I mean, can you imagine if we needed a programmer to move something over three pixels? Now, if we, if we focus more on the exploratory angle, uh, hypermedia could be the basis of new tools for thought, you know, new like brainstorming, mind mapping, that sort of thing. A lot of the early visions of hypermedia, all, going all the way back to the, the Memex in 1944 and Vannevar Bush's uh, uh, article, As We May Think, this is exactly what they were. They're, they're, this, they're systems for like academic research. Now, like scholarly works, for example, they could show analysis and primary sources side by side, allowing you, know, you, allowing you to make direct connections between the ideas and their context. Now, this could be useful, you know, both for the researcher organizing their thoughts as they write the analysis, as, as well as those who study it down the line. But that has some obvious implications for journalists, too. I mean, imagine if every fact cited in a news story could be linked back to its source with annotations explaining the relevance. I mean, you know, the global hybrid media network, it could, it could usher in a new era of informed audiences and, and, and maybe even voters. <sighs> now, I, I don't want to focus entirely on work. Um, now, empowering users, you know, we, we're not just our, we're not our jobs. It goes beyond helping you do, do your work. Hybrid media can help your life. It can help us with you know, self-expression and exploration. Now, uh, uh, the cynics in the audience are probably saying, well, yeah, this was the same promise of desktop publishing too. But you know, as, as I mentioned before, desktop publishing, it's, it's kind of a misnomer. It's, it, it's desktop page layout, but the publishing is still has to go to you know, a service bureau for printing. It's, you know, the, making page layout accessible does not you know, solve the distribution challenges. But with, with, the, but, but with hypermedia, but with, with the, over the internet, you know, a global hypermedia network makes personal publishing truly accessible. Now, we won't all be members of the professional media, but perhaps we'll be able to participate in a, a new kind of social media. So the, the other question I, I posed was, how will today's programmers uh, empower the hypermedia authors? I see our work in the future to be a lot like the role of hardware and system software today. We're, we're providing the infrastructure that all of this depends on. We're like, we are the substrate. And we're going to be building the tools that hypermedia authors use, like, you know, the low-level primitives and like, the widgets that they use to compose their work. You know, right now, a lot of this comes from uh, first parties. So in, in addition to HyperCard itself and the HyperTalk language, Apple provides a whole bunch of like, ready-made buttons and fields and stuff. Uh, this, is the, this is what I, I guess you would think of as like HyperCard's standard library. 
Um, on a side note, they also provide some fantastic clip art. Uh, it's not all animals using um, Apple computers, but there's, there's a lot of that. Um, but, but first parties can't provide everything. Uh, there's, you know, there, there, there's a... Uh, there's, there's a small community of, of third-party widget makers today, it, but as the world becomes more connected, this community is going to eclipse and eventually dwarf the first-party contributions. Now, all, all of these people sharing these widgets, they, they form an ecosystem. Uh, all the individual components become connected and support each other as a whole. I like to think of this as like asynchronous collaboration, where people who've never met nevertheless become interdependent on each other's code. Now, it's important to realize that the ecosystem is going to need to work at both ends, you know, publishing and consuming, for people with a wide range of abilities. You know, we, we, the way we imagine this may be that you know, the author is going to be using the widgets and the programmers are going to be making them, but the inverse is going to be true as well. Uh, programmers are going to want to use the ecosystem for their own projects, you know, for, you know, sh you know sharing code. Um, and authors are going to want to share widgets that they've modified or composed from, from smaller pieces. So it's important to, that the, these users will have different needs and workflows, but still have like, the same goals. And we, need, we need to accommodate that. And also, the unit of abstraction isn't necessarily going to be as small as widgets. You know, sometimes you know, common workflows and widget collections will aggregate into frameworks. Um, you know, knowledge bases and online magazines and adventure games, uh, they all work pretty well within the rubric of hypermedia, but each has a specific set of needs. And these groups are going to develop their own standards and ecosystems, even like social mores, within those of hypermedia as a whole. So this widget and framework ecosystem these are going to be, these are going to be a, an on-ramp into traditional programming for a lot of people as they move from you know, doing little bits of scripting here and there to you know, writing business logic to actually mo modifying the core of the projects that they're using on. If there's any, if there's any one thing that I think is going to bridge the gap between users and programmers, this is it. And now the hard part. What we need to change in our culture to enable this growth. So as I, as I was researching the history of hypermedia, I noticed a, a, a common theme running through the foundational text, you know, a, a sense of responsibility. In, uh, as we may think, Vannevar Bush, was, he, was, he was actually on the Manhattan Project, and he was writing this uh, you know, as he was developing the atomic bomb, and he was thinking about, he was, he, was, he was trying to come to terms with how much of his work during the war had been, he, he had been making weapons. Uh, and he, he was by no means a pacifist, but he understood that his work was not neutral. You know, he saw that building weapons you know, was his responsibility in wartime, and in peacetime, healing the world was his responsibility. But we as programmers, we don't talk a lot about our responsibility. I mean, we're, you know, we're not making atomic bombs, but we, we, can still, we can't look at how much everything has changed in the 70s and 80s and act like that, you know, we're not making an impact. You know, some of it's good, some of it's bad, but none of it is value neutral. And, and while our world is becoming increasingly dependent on software, the creation of that software isn't becoming democratized. If anything, it's heading towards oligarchy. It's, as, as programming becomes more and more of an elite and credentialed field, uh, the software industry, it's, it's, it seems to be recapitulating the excesses of the Gilded Age. You know, only with you know, technology as the lever of class ratification instead of railroads and oil. Now, a lot of you are, are probably saying, like, well, I, didn't, I didn't create this world. You know, we didn't start the fire. It was always burning since the world's been turning. Um, and, you're, and you're right, but this isn't, it's not about guilt or who started it. It's that we're all parts of this machine now, and, and we participate in its operation. Unless we are actively fighting against it, we are, in some ways, supporting it. We support the system when we abdicate our agency, when we write software that harms our users because it's just a job. We support the system in the work that we choose not to do when we decide that nobody really needs hooks for accessibility or customization or composability. Those are, you know, empowering users, that's not providing business value. And we support this system with the teams that we build. Uh, we're all familiar with the phenomena of hiring managers saying, oh, well, you don't actually need to know anything about the banking industry. You'll, you'll learn the business on the job, immediately followed by five years C++ experience required. Uh, then we act, but then, then we act all surprised that we've got these teams full of people who think like us and act like us and, let's face it, look like us. So I, I, I keep coming to the, back to this, this notion of a bicycle for the mind. Uh, so we just the full quote, and this is Steve Jobs. Um, I read a study that measured the efficiency of locomotion for various species on the planet. The condor used the least, efficiency to move a, uh, le least energy to move a kilometer. Humans came in with a rather unimpressive showing about a third of the way down the list. 
That didn't look so good, but then somebody at Scientific American had the insight to test the efficiency of locomotion for a man on a bicycle, and a man on a bicycle blew the condor away. That's what a computer is to me. The computer is the most remarkable tool that we've ever come up with. It's the equivalent of a bicycle for our minds. Now, this speaks to me on a couple of levels. I mean, you know, not only is the, you know, the bicycle a tool that human, increases human ability, but it's a fundamentally democratic one, too. I mean, you can, you can sink a lot of money into a nice bike, but even a cheap single-speed Huffy will get you around. It's a machine that is eminently fixable and understandable, you know, suitable for children at play and adults at work. The computers we have today are not bicycles. Instead, we've got something more like, I don't know, a car for the mind, which, you know, it gets you around, it's easier and more comfortable than a bike, but at what cost? You know, when America decided that it was going to be a place for cars, we signed ourselves up for urban sprawl and air pollution and car crashes and oil wars. Even on a human scale, cars are as much liabilities as they are assets. I mean, I'm sure we all know people who are working terrible jobs to keep their junker car running so they can get to their terrible job. Now, what happens if we go on with our lives without taking responsibility? Let's suppose that technology changes as dramatically as, as I'm predicting here, but our fundamental culture remains the same. Well, I see a world in which computers are a thousand times more powerful, powerful to, than today, and they fit inside your pocket, but the tools for building software are the same arcane text editors we've been using since the 70s. I see a tech industry serving a generation that grew up with computers and understands them intuitively, distributed all over the globe, and yet the industry itself is like some kind of nerd country club with disposable immigrant labor at the bottom, vampire billionaires at the top, and for some reason, you know, and for some reason everybody has to relocate to San Francisco. <laughs> now, in my darkest moments, I see a world where everyone is constantly connected to a global hypermedia network where every movement is tracked, every behavior is analyzed, so advertisers can better deceive us. That's where we're headed. But we can change direction. Even if we're still on this trajectory in 2016, we can still change. The history of computing is filled with small teams having a huge impact. Uh, the entire Xerox Park uh, organization could fit inside this room. Uh, the first version of HyperCard was made by a team of five people. For all we know, the, the technology that dominates the next 25 years could be, I don't know, a documentation project at a European particle accelerator. Uh, these, these innovations are as much cultural as they are technological. I mean, the systems designed at Xerox were marvels of engineering, but it's not the code that endures. It's their legacy is, the, is a culture of user research and humane design. And culture is not an artifact, it's a process that needs to be enacted, it needs to be embodied. We all know how groundbreaking new technology can struggle in the face of misunderstanding and dismissal and fear, uncertainty and doubt. Just imagine how much pushback new cultural concepts must necessarily get. It's our responsibility to recognize, adopt and evangelize new social mores with the same enthusiasm and tenacity as we do with new tech. I presented you two visions of the future. Uh, one where we build a global hypermedia network to bring the power of programming to ordinary people, and one in which we use it to make some rich guys even richer. The basic technology is the same. All the difference lies in how we choose to use it. Thank you. <laughs>